بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشير ونذير بين يدي الساعة أما بعد فيا عباد الله اتقوا الله اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون وقال الله تبارك وتعالى وتوبوا إلى الله توبة نصوحا We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us life, for giving us our faith and we send prayers and peace upon the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and upon his blessed companions and wives and his blessed family and all those that follow him. And I enjoin you and I advise you and I advise myself to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala outwardly and inwardly. Avoiding the commands of Allah outwardly and inwardly. Implementing the commands outwardly and in, in, inwardly and avoiding the prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala outwardly and inwardly. The Blessed Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not leave anything except that he addressed it. If something was not addressed in the Quran, it was addressed through his hadith. And this guide that he has given us, a guidebook, is for us at all times of our lives, as children, as teenagers, as adults, as the elderly, on our deathbeds, this guide is, at, is there for us every second of our lives. There's nothing else that we need, nothing new that's going to come. Everything that needs to be addressed about human character and about the human state and about our societies has already been addressed. The only thing that we have to do is open that book, the Quran, and open up the seerah and the, the hadith and the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, open it up and accept it. And accept it full heartedly and submit to it. And submit to it, brothers and sisters. We have to submit to it. We have to submit our intellects. We have to submit our experiences and put everything aside. And make the guiding factor, the judge, the Quran and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why is it that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala refers to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Surah Al-Isra as a abd, a slave? Subhana alladhi asra bi abdihi layla. Glory be to the one who took his abd, his slave, and took him on the night journey. The abd is the one who is in complete submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He put aside his own feelings and made the Quran his deciding factor. And so he became truly a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can never be like him. Our whole life is going to be an attempt to be like him and to come into this ubudiyah, this servanthood, and to become true slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we do that? We have to work towards making the Quran and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the deciding factor in our lives. At every point, regardless of the situation, we're watching horrendous things happen on the news to our dear brothers and sisters all around the world. How do we deal with that? We all feel confused. We all feel confused. And we all feel helpless. And we all feel shamed. We're ashamed of ourselves in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our personal states and for what we have let our societies go to. It's not a problem on the other side of the world, brothers and sisters. We're ummatun wahida. We are one ummah. We feel the pain of the other side of the ummah and we also take responsibility for what's happening on the other side of the ummah. And we're confused, we don't know what to do. And we can only ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us. But the first stage that we can, that we have to take in trying to address 
the issues of the Ummah is in addressing our own personal issues. And we start with our hearts. And we ask, our, are our hearts in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And in submission to following the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah says in the Quran, Qul, He's saying to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to the Blessed Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, In kuntum tuhibbun Allah, say, tell him, to, telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tell the Sahaba, tell the people, do you love Allah? Qul in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, say, do you love Allah? Do you really love Allah? And this is a question that many people ask themselves, Muslims or non-Muslims. I believe in the Creator, but do I love Him? And many people will feel in their hearts, yes, I love Allah, I love God, I love Dios, I love Khuda, I love the Creator, the Great Spirit, whatever it is that you want to call Him, I love Him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving them the test, do you really love them? Qul in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, say to them, if you love Allah, fattabi'uni, follow me. Follow the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Who when we say his name Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we're praising him Even when the enemies of Islam say his name, they're saying The praised one Muhammad The often praised one Even when they try to criticize him, they're, if you translate it into your language, into our language, English they're saying, oh, and the praised one, the often, the one who's praised a lot, did this and this and this. So even in their criticisms of him, even in their attacks of him, they're forced to praise him. And they're forced to recognize that he is the praised one. This is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have to follow him. يُحْبِبْكُمُ Allah, And then Allah will love you. So that is the deciding factor. How do we know if we love Allah? We, how much are we following the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? That is the deciding factor. And what is this following of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Is it merely an outward following? Is it doing things that he did just to be like photocopies of him? Outwardly? If we look at the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had a beard. There's many people besides the Muslims that have beards. There's many Muslims that have beards. He wore a turban, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he encouraged us to wear a turban. But there's other people that wear turbans. In fact, they get in trouble sometimes because people misidentify them as being Muslims because of their turbans. And he had a sunnah and a way of living, and we can go on and on in many other examples. Is that what makes us a follower of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, by following him outwardly? It's very important for us when we look at our communities and we look at our societies or even when we look at our homes to look at Medina, the blessed city of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who according to which according to Imam Malik is greater in its fadl than Mecca. And I know that comes as a shock to many people. Many of the ulama, Imam Shafi, Abu Hanifa, uh, and many of the other scholars, Rahmatullahi Alayhim, they said that Mecca was more virtuous. And Imam Malik has many proofs from the Quran showing that Medina is actually greater. Whichever one it is, that's not, uh, it's not a point of, of debate, but it's to show you that Imam Malik considered Medina to be better because it was the Prophet wasallam he who made it better. Mecca, and this is one of the hikmas of the hijrah, of the immigration, because Allah wanted to show the people he is not special, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because of the city that he is in. Remember, Mecca was at the seat of Arabia. All of the Arabs recognized the Kaaba. Even the even the, the Jews and the Christians recognized the blessedness of that city, of that valley, because of that house that was built by Ibrahim alayhi salam. So if he had stayed there, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, people would think, oh, he's special because of that city. There was already a specialness about it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His infinite wisdom took the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam out of Mecca and put him in Medina and showed people, look, it's not the city that makes him special. He makes the city special. Look at Medina by taking him out and showing him. Medina before that had a name that we shouldn't even mention. That we shouldn't even, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, don't mention the old name. Now it's called Al Medina, the city. And it has many other names. Al-Habiba, Al-Qayba, Al-Taba, many names. 
but it became the city. That's why some people don't even like referring to other cities as the city. We know in our culture people refer to San Francisco as the city. I would encourage us to not use that. Because if you translate the city into Arabic, what does it become? El Medina. The city. That's not El Medina. El Medina is in the Hijaz. It's the city. Because the Prophet Sallallahu made it the city. This is a special Prophet that Allah sent to us. Now how do we follow him? We look at his city, Medina. We look at the society. We find people in their, that society that were following him outwardly to a certain extent. They're called the hypocrites. <laughs> they went to the masjid. His sunnah was to go to the masjid and pray. They prayed. They went to the masjid. They fasted. He said his sunnahs give sadaqah. They gave sadaqah. They gave the worst of their wealth as sadaqah, but they gave it. He said give zakat. They give zakat. He said make hajj. They made hajj. Pray in the masjid. They prayed in the masjid. But they were the, 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 the last of the masjid. They were last to get there and they never caught the opening takbir. They prayed like they were bored and sick of what they had to do. But they did it. They had a following. So is that the deciding factor? فَتَبِعُونِي Follow me, follow the messenger. Is that considered following? It's not. Why? Because what's the difference? The difference between the munafiq and the believer is that one, we believe him to be the messenger of Allah. So we have to believe, we know he's the messenger of Allah and he was sent with the final message. We don't have any doubt about it like the munafiqeen. And secondly, we love him. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We love him. And we should love him more than we love our children and more than we love our parents and more than we love ourselves. It's easy to say. It's easy to say that. But it's a life journey to try to achieve that. And as an example, Umar ibn al-Khattab said one time to the Messenger of Allah Yes, I love you more than I love myself. And the Prophet said, No, Umar, not yet. Umar thought and he reflected. <coughs> he recalibrated inside and then he said, Now I do. And the Prophet وسلم, looked at him and said, now you do. That was Umar. It wasn't natural for him to love the Messenger of Allah وسلم, to that degree. He had to work on it. And similarly, we have to work on it. We have to learn to love the Messenger of Allah وسلم. People fall in love and they fall out of love. It's not a given. Love is not a given. You can love your siblings as you grow up with them. And we know in society, sometimes some of the worst enemies are siblings. You could love your people. And then a civil war happens and then they become your worst enemies. People fall in love with their <coughs> countrymen and their, their family and so forth. And then they fall out of love. It's an emotion that goes up and down. And so we have to train it. We have to train <laughs> ourselves to love the Messenger of Allah That's why the Messenger of Allah said in a hadith, أَدِّبُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ عَلَىٰ ثَلَاثِ خِصَالِ حُبِّ نَبِيِّكُمْ وَحُبِّ أَهْلِ بَيْتِهِ وَقِرَاءَةِ الْقُرْآنِ He's guiding us. O Kamaqad. The Messenger of Allah said, Train your children to have three qualities. Love of the Messenger, love of the, your Prophet. And love of his family and reciting the Qur'an. Now many of us put our children in schools or in Sunday schools to memorize the Qur'an, to learn the Qur'an. And we put them through a program. And there's a curriculum for that. And there's a teacher and there's training for that. But that's number three in what was mentioned. Where do we have in our homes and in our schools and in our societies a way to teach our children to love the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Now love is not a science that you Punch in an equation and you get a, a, an effect. That's why you'll see in the Qur'an, you go to a Qur'an teacher, he says, if you do this, this, and this, you'll get this result. Sometimes the child is different, you have to change a little bit, but generally, it's more of a science than love. Love is it's, it's more of an art. But we have to do something. The Prophet ﷺ said, أَدِّبُوا Train them, give them ta'deeb, give them adab to love your Prophet. Now when he said our, our children, we shouldn't just think it's just our children, it's also ourselves. 
Because until we fully matured spiritually, we're like children. Even if you're 50, 60, 70 years old. That's why some of the ulama, when they write books, they said, كَتَبْتُ هَذَا الْكِتَابِ لِلْأَوْلَادِ وَنَحْوِهِمْ I wrote this book for children and those like children. What does that mean? That means the people that are physically and chronologically children, and then those people who chronologically and physically they're adults, but inside developmentally, spiritually, emotionally, they're like children. We have to raise up the child, the childlike nature in ourselves. So we have to train ourselves, cha train our childlike selves to love the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How do we do that? That's, there's a lot of methods for that, time-tested methods. Sometimes it's just mohiba. It's just a gift from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. You see some children that they have an intense love for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they'll cry as children when they hear poetry about him. And they'll love to hear stories about him. And that was just a gift that Allah gave that, that special children. And may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala give that gift to all of our children and to all of us. But then other children need guidance. And they need stories. One of the methods is to bring the seerah to life. We have to be telling the seerah to our children in our car rides as bedtime stories. One of the greatest scholars of, in the Muslim history, his name is Sidi Ahmed Zarruq. And if you're not familiar with his name, it's very important to understand who he is in our tradition. Because he was one of the scholars that joined between the science of fiqh and the science of tasawwuf. The science of purification of the heart and the science of the outward legal rulings, fiqh. Many people go to one extreme on one way or the other and he was able to master both sciences, both subjects, and be able to tell the fuqaha, the jurists, what you're doing here, here, and here is wrong. And be able to tell the sufiya what you're doing here, here, and here is, in a, is not in accordance with the Qur'an and Sunnah. Because the true people of Tasawwuf, according to Imam Junaid al-Baghdadi, are the ones who follow the Qur'an and Sunnah. That's all it is. Whether you want to call it Tasawwuf or another name, it's following the Qur'an and Sunnah. Imam Junaid, who's the Imam of the Science of Purification of the Heart, said, whatever is mentioned by the people of the Sufiyyah that's not in accordance with the Qur'an and Sunnah, then reject it. It's not from this path. Sidi Ahmed Zarruq was able to revive that and to bring people back to the Qur'an and Sunnah. And not all of the, 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 the innovations that were, that, were, that were placed in. Sidi Ahmed Zarruq was orphaned as a child, and he was raised by his grandmother. So the person who gave him tarbiyah was his grandmother. One of the things that she did is she trained him to have to look on Allah, to depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How would she do that? They were poor, and they lived in fasts in the city, in one of the greatest cities of the Ummah, in Morocco. Um, and she would hide food in the house, and then she would say, Ahmed, let's make dua. And they would make dua for food, and they said, now let's look for the food. And they would go around in the house and look for the food, and then he would finally say, Allah answered our dua. She was training him how to, have, to depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another thing that she did, that instead of telling her child, I mean her grandchild, Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, stories, fairy tales, and those type of things that, that other people tell to their children and at bedtime and during the day, she would tell stories of the Salihi, of the Prophets, of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his seerah, and of the Prophets, and of the awliya, and of the friends of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, Training him to have this love, and look who he is in our history. He was, he renewed a lot for both in the science of fiqh and in the science of tasawwuf, and it came from his grandmother, teaching him how to love the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and those that came after him and those that came before him, the Prophets. So we have to bring the seerah to life. We have to know who our Messenger is Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the way he looked. If you look at children or if you look at people who follow a singer or a musician or a sports player or a basketball, they want to know what's his favorite food. What was his hobby? What does he like to do on this time? Uh, uh, when he's not in the season and all of those, they want to know all of those details. Do we know the details of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Do we know the details of how he slept? Of how he looked? Of how he ate? Of how he dressed? This is in the science of the Shama'i. 
If you don't in your house have the book called the Shama'il of Imam Al-Tirmidhi, you have to get it. You have to get it. It's available in English, it's available in Arabic, it's available in Urdu. There's many translations of it. Get it, read it, study it with, uh, with a scholar or with a teacher, and bring it to life for your children. So that they know more about him. Oh, he liked to eat this food. This is how he drank. This is how he walked. This is how he slept. And the more you know him, the more you love him. Because how can we love something that we don't know? Just think about a situation. Say there was a, a catastrophe on the other side of the earth. If you just heard about it, there's a catastrophe in this land. There was a tsunami and a lot of people got hurt. Okay, I feel sorry and I wish I could help them. But once you start learning more about it, and you see pictures, and you hear detailed accounts, and you hear people's personal experiences from that, it becomes real and live for you, and now you're emotionally attached. The same thing with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As long as his name is just in our homes as on a picture on the wall, and we mention him every once in a while, it's not real for our children and for ourselves. We have to bring him to life in mentioning his qualities and his shamati, that's another way. And I'll also mention the Shifa of Qadr Iyab. If you don't have that book, it's very important to get that because it's a Shifa bi ta'rif al-Huquq al-Mustafa. Knowing the true Huquq, what we owe to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The reason why it's especially important in our day and age is the same reason that at certain points in the Sirah it was important is because we have people attacking his character. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In Mecca, they called him all of those names. We know them, we read them in the Quran, and Allah rejects them. He said, you're not majnoon, you're not crazy, you're not bewitched, you're not a poet. He rejects all of this propaganda that Quraysh was putting out there. And they would put it out with musicians. They would put this criticism to music, and put the musicians out on the pathways leading to his classes, and they would try to distract people by giving all this false information about the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How different does that sound than what we're experiencing? And in this day and age, for, especially for our children, and especially if they're in public schools and in the, they're the minority in their, as they're growing up, they're the minority in their schools, they're the minority amongst their friends, they're the minority on their sports team, what do you think they're going to be hearing? They're going to be hearing a lot of the Qurayshi insults, just in a different form. They're going to be hearing these things. And then as they grow up, then they start doubting him. Because as people pull them away from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you don't have to give him all that respect. He was a man in history just like other men in history. No, he wasn't. We don't believe that. But as they pull him down from his high maqam and make him more and more just a historical figure that could have made mistakes, that was just a man, then now they're, they're opening those people up for doubting the message of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I'll end this first khutbah to remind us of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, who on the day after Isra wa Mi'raj, he was outside of the city. So as Quraysh were putting out their new set of propaganda, new set of propaganda, oh he said this, that's totally irrational. It's irrational. But we don't look at the rational. We submit our intellects because we believe he's the messenger of Allah. We define what's truth by him, not by our intellects. The people that have not submitted their intellects cannot accept him as being the messenger of Allah. But let's look at a person who submitted his intellect so much so that if you took half of the ummah, his faith would be stronger than theirs. The Quraysh were putting out their propaganda in, Me in Mecca. This is a false story. How could he have gone to Jerusalem in one night? How could he have gone to the heavens and come back all in one night? And then some of the believers started being shaken. And we have people today in our society, in our communities, maybe in this masjid, that are being shaken by the propaganda out there. By the news, by the videos, by the movies, by the books, by the songs, by the raps by the stars saying things against the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Same practices. They came to Abu Bakr Siddiq, he didn't even think twice. He didn't even flinch. What did he say? In qalahu faqad sadaq. If he said it, he's telling the truth. That's all I need to know. You don't need to give me any details. 
You don't need to give me your commentary on what happened. If he said it, it's the truth. That should be our motto. If he said it, it's the truth. And we need to raise our children, especially in this society, to have that as their motto. If he said it, it's the truth. Because not every one of us are going to become scholars. And the truth is that on the other side, of the people that are attacking Islam, they have scholars. They have people that know our religion better than many of us know our religion. They know Hadith. They know Quran. They know Tafsir. They know Fiqh. And they'll pull different things out and present it to the average Muslim and say, See, how can this be true? How can this Hadith be true? Can you really believe a man who said this? Think about your intellect. You're an American. You're a Briton. You're a British. You're a, a Australian. You're modern. Can you believe this? The first response we should say, just train it. In qalahu faqad sadaq. Train your children. Train yourselves. In qalahu faqad sadaq. I don't know what it means. And I'll have to go back and ask my scholars. But I'm just giving you the, the first. If he said it, it's true. Abu Bakr Siddiq says that. Stop them right in their path. If he said it, it's true. But now let me explain it to you. You're amazed that he can't make this trip in one night from Jerusalem to here, to back to Mecca in one night. And I believe that he gets revelation from above seven heavens in one instant. I already believed that from before, so how would it be hard for me to believe this? So he had a, a rational response for them. So we do have to have our rational responses to put out, but we have to have the Abu Bakr Siddiq methodology, where it's in Qala Abu Fakat Sadaq. If we truly love him, we'll say whatever he said is true. Now let's try to figure it out. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tathbeet and to give us the steadfastness that he gave to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and to all of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'een and to give us hubba nabiyyihi and to give us love of his Prophet and hubba ahli baytihi alayhi salatu was salam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu was salamu ala Rasulihi al-Kareem وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ما بعد يا عباد الله اتقوا الله اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون وتوبوا إلى الله توبة نصوحة I enjoin you and I enjoin myself after beginning in the name of Allah and sending praises and praising him Allah سبحانه وتعالى and sending blessings and prayers upon his prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم I enjoin you and I enjoin myself to have تقوى of Allah and to fear Allah outwardly and inwardly, to fulfill all of His commands and to avoid all of His prohibitions. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us, taught us, encouraged us, ordered us to train our children to love Him. And then what's the second thing He mentioned in that hadith? وَحُبِّ أَهْلِ بَيْتِهِ And to love His أَهْلُ bayt, to love His family, now we could go on and speak about the love of his family and what that means and how our love for him will never be complete until we love the messengers of Allah's family. But I want us to take one lesson from the way people treated the messenger of Allah's family and have it clear up some confusion for us because I know a lot of us, and I'm saying this for me first and foremost, feeling confused and helpless because of what's going on in the world and because what we see people doing to our brothers and sisters and because what we see them doing to the children we feel confused, we feel helpless and we might even ask ourselves a very dangerous question that we all have to be careful about why? why? why did this happen? Why does this happen? Why do good things, bad things happen to good people? This question is a question that leads, leads many people, and I've talked with them. I spoke with somebody last week who told me he left faith because he asked this question. He said, I can't believe in God anymore. He was a Vietnam vet. He said, I saw what happened in Vietnam. I don't need to explain to you what he's, he has seen, the horrors of war. He said, I've seen that. I can't believe in God. If there was a God, why did he let that happen?